this morning having your Bibles or the Bibles that are in front of you in the pews, if you would turn to Romans chapter 1. You know, in Romans chapter 1 last week, and uh, I actually kind of closed out last week with uh, both ver uh, those verses 15, 16, and I believe even 17. And this morning, I also want to go back and touch those verses leading up to, I believe it's the end of the chapter in chapter 1 with Paul's writings. For a long time, uh, we could be honest with ourselves or know this as this thought process that um, in the world that we live in and the world that has been in our past, churches have kind of made fools of themselves, have disgraced, if I may, the scriptures in such a way of uh, their own interpretations. Um, I know if, if, uh, being here you will have heard me, um, uh, even with the visual, you know, we do not take our Bibles and beat individuals over their head um, describing exactly how you will go to hell, especially if you don't memorize these these pages that I'm holding in my hand, and and we and that's I say it that way because that's how a lot of times um, churches mess it up, and uh, in the world that we live in today, the media grabs onto it immediately, or YouTube grabs on it, or Facebook grabs on it immediately and broadcasts it to thousands, probably sometimes. Of view, they call viewers. All these viewers are seeing. Here's the mistake that the church has made, and then they then they tag this little tag with it. And that is why I'm not a part of it, because I don't want to be like them. And so they are right, because there's times where the church has made so many mistakes, and and and. Well, let me just very quickly thought process. David Koresh in Waco, Texas. And kids die. Along with adults. And, and, and here's the thing. In, in that time frame, you had this. You had the battle of words on the church. And you had battles of words on the government. And see, nobody wins. Because there's all of this, this hatred. There's all of this... And, and that's what it becomes. It, it's a hatred either toward the government or it's a hatred toward the church. You have, uh, if I may, uh, uh, some Westboro, and that's all I can remember. Um, I believe they were a Baptist organization. And please don't take me wrong on this. I'm not trying to connect with different denominations. What I'm saying is individuals. There was individuals that would sit there and they would, they would just browbeat people they would browbeat those who uh um for all kinds of reasons if, if there was something that they hated then they were there with their posters and and may i say this in all of those poster hanging hanging people i did not see one person fall on their knees for salvation and this is why i say the church has got it wrong because if you sit there and think because you're going to um, accuse someone of their sin, and maybe this is what the big problem is with the church. We have no problem accusing others of their sin while we hold on to our own. And, and, then, and then we're dismayed. Why? I wonder why no one is falling down on their knees to worship the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ and, and, and to accept him. You know, because what they're doing is they are looking exactly at you who say you're this great ambassador. If I was to quote scripture, because that's what it says, you are his ambassador. Or you are the one who represents Christ. You're the one who represents the church. And so when they're looking at you and the hatred, and they're hearing the hatred, and please don't take it as in you guys. I'm just trying to show you, this is how the church sometimes is seen in the world. So hateful. And if you hate so much, um, 
I'm going to tell you why some of them don't fall down and worship Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because a lot of them know scripture and say, if you have hate, your own scripture says you're not supposed to hate. And yet the church represents that. And that is why there's not, that's why the, the, ready? the pews are not filled. And so what takes place is, is that uh, uh, I wish the church would get it right. And the way you get it right is exactly how Paul, especially here in, in, in Romans chapter 1 and all of his other writings and how other prophets and how Jesus himself those that were um, writers and teachers and, and know this, that that individuals, as they began to express, people were jotting down. Did you see? Not only did they say it, but they lived it. And that's the church that we need to be. That way you'll be able to stand strong in your faith with the life that you live. So that when someone says, you know what? Why is it that God is so angry at people that he will kill them. And, and so for, for some of us here this morning, we probably sit here going, you know, I don't even know how to answer that. You know, and I'm talking about like Old Testament. Because this is how they do it. In the Old Testament of the Bible that you hold on to, God, he destroyed people. Um, we, we had the scripture reading this morning. And it, it was considered the faith chapter in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, where it was talked about Noah. And you're saying, there's the, you know, look at what Noah, in, in that time frame, according to your scripture, the entire planet was wiped out, except for Noah's family. Why, why is there such an angry God? Why do you serve such an angry God like that? Um, and before I get into my, my own thought process with the scripture, let me say it this way. Uh, please read the whole Bible. Because as you um, see a process that is walked through, um, you know what? Let's come up to the New Testament with the Savior Jesus Christ who, who is always pointing to the Father that you say is so hateful and you'll never see a hateful Father through the Savior's words. And so let's just, and now I'm not browbeating, I'm saying, because here's the thing, we, we prayed about it, we talked about it, that I just want opportunity to talk with you. Not to... Um, uh, be the one that is uh, a list maker, you know, this is all you got to have, but let's have conversation. Why? Because I want you to see a life that I live and what follows with it. In the area of text where I'm at this morning, it, it actually is kind of a, a difficult one um, because of, as I was in my kind of opening remark here, is that um, here is where a lot of churches take when they love to con condemn other people's sin, what a great chapter to go to. <laughs> ah, because it, there's quite a list here of, of sins that we could really knock some people down with. But I want to go back up to verse 15 of Romans chapter 1, reading to verse 32. It's written this way from Paul. So I am eager to come to you in Rome too, to preach the good news for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ it is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes the Jew first and also the Gentiles this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight this is accomplished from start to finish by faith as the scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous person has life I open it with this before I go into the other scriptures, knowing this. You know what? Paul, his full intent was not to browbeat. His full intent was to bring you face to face with the Savior. The one who is the power of God. And with that power of God, what is it? To save everyone who believes. We have to grasp that thought process so that when... As the list makers of sins would do, 
These are the people that are going to walk through your door. And they're going to sit in your pews. And they're going to eat your breakfast. And they're going to sit in the, the, uh, the, the, the Sunday school learning. They're going to come on Wednesday night Bible study and learn. They're going to have coffee with you. They're going to, they're going to do other functions with you. These people are not these people. They're everybody. Just like you were and I was when my sin was forgiven. And for everyone that believes, this is what the power of the gospel is. The good news of Jesus Christ is. And it's going to save everyone who believes. <laughs> I said this before. Not in my eyes. But in God's eyes are made right. See, I say all this first because we have got to get it right in our heads. It is not about, we are not the condemners nor the savers. We are only this vessel that God uses to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to someone else. So that they may be seen right in God's eyes. And then it is through faith that this righteousness is life. See, if you want to talk about something that's really cool, talk about life, not death, but life. Because even in a, Christ, in a Christian's uh, walk, we know this, that there, there is no death. Death, where is thy sting? It's gone. Why is it gone? It might be a last breath, but that's just it. Because it is eternity with the Father, those who are following Jesus Christ. And so now it brings me to verse 18. In... Uh, uh, it is, I always talk about sometimes highlighted titles and stuff like that. It is, it is God's anger at sin. In my Bible, that's what the, 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 the little break of scriptures, there's this title. It is God's anger at sin. And this, is, I, I read that over and over. And I parenthesize some words for myself as a reminder. It's God's anger at sin, not at people. Understand what I'm saying? See, God loves people. He loves all people, which is why previously it is for everyone that believes. It is for everyone. So God loves people. He just is angry at our sin. Notice I said our. Because there are a follower of Christ who still mess up, make mistakes, fall and trapped into sin. Verse 18, God chose his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see the, in, his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. They have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, 
envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malice, behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them. Bear with me for these next few minutes. I don't know, if, as I was reading that, if you could, vis could just envision within your head some of what I was talking about, where you would see video clips or news clips or, or, or just some uh, uh, clips uh, uh, other places, or even conversation with friends and family members of some of these things where either, may I, we have condemned people with sin or we have looked at them or heard others look at them and say, that's why they're going to hell. And have forgotten that it is about the good news of Christ, the power of God. Have forgotten that See, I like how Paul wrote it. Just so we are not confused. The Savior has come. And if you read, if you read through the scriptures, uh, especially the walk in, of life of Jesus, you will see opportunities where he has, has revealed to, especially the twelve, or revealed to his three close friends. He has a, a revealing of how God is at work. And, and, and so there's people that had many opportunities of being revealed to by what God does. All of them. Is God a provider? Yes, he is. He fed the 5,000, did he not? He fed the 4,000, did he not? He raised the dead, did he not? God is one who intervenes. And so we have the Savior, Jesus Christ, who in his ministry especially just revealed to us who God is, pointing us to the direction of a, a greater understanding of God. Because he told those that were standing around at, after his resurrection, why do you, you know, uh, that, that there's one that is coming after me. The promise is to you. Greater things you will do. In the scripture text that we read, when we have this understanding of who God is, and that it is for everyone, there's the section where there is no excuse. Uh, you know what? And I rarely ever tell jokes. I'm not even going to tell this joke very good. I'm just going like, to paraphrase it because it's just a reminder to me of uh, growing up. Um, you probably heard it many different ways, but it is the scientist versus God joke. And, and I'm not going to say stop me because I'm just going to say it real quick. Here's how it went. A scientist thought he was better than God, and he challenged God because he told God, I can make a better human being than you. And so as the joke goes, God's like, oh, really? Okay, I'll accept that challenge. And so the scientists began to gather dust to create this human being. And God goes, oh, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. Get your own dust. <laughs> and I say this because what it does is it, it brings us into this, this reality of everything God has created and and and, and for a, a, a lot of it it's like oh he created this he created that he created this he created that and, and we know this what I'm saying is this take it as your opportunity that God has blessed us with this creation God has done this for us everything that takes place because it comes from God even from the greatest of inventions it came from someone that had a mind that God created. I mean, you get it down to the minutest thing. That before that person was formed, we know in scripture, God already knew about the greatest of scientists, the greatest of minds. Why? Because God was already there. So, there is no excuse it removes every excuse from every person to not follow Jesus. Now, you can choose not to follow him, but you don't have an excuse to go, I never knew about him. 
that's funny because Christmas came every year. And, 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 and how do I know that that's no excuse? Because even people who don't believe in Jesus know about Christmas as the birth of Jesus. Doesn't matter what religion you follow, you know that the Christians follow Jesus. Just like Christians know about this prophet over here or that prophet over there that is not in the realm of, of, of a godly work. <laughs> I'll just say it that way. Because these prophets are evil. They went from maybe loving God to murdering God. Murder, murdering. That's not God. That makes that prophet wrong. Don't follow this prophet. It removes every opportunity of excuse. You, now, see, this, remember I said the church gets it wrong? It is for this purpose. Because the church should be showing people and teaching people how to live in faith. So all of this list that was read, rather than being the person that goes, because you know what the big one was, right? First one he said, ladies are gay, it is wrong. Men are gay, it is wrong. The, the way that is being taught by so many is, guess what? Oh yeah, you're going straight to hell. Turn on our backs on. I'm just turning my back on. I will not look at you. I will not talk to you. I will not associate with you because you are not part of the kingdom, my realm. Whereas the way we should be doing it is, you know what? The opposite. Because I'm not asking for hands up, but I know personally a gay person. Okay? Now, that being said, what do you do? You, I, live by faith. So that what? Someone might have the opportunity to do what Paul said at the very beginning, so that they will have the opportunity to know the power of God and the salvation that comes through the Savior, Jesus Christ. That's how we should be as a church. Which then makes us look at these, this list so different. First of all, for just us, Though, the, us that are followers of Jesus Christ. In Paul's writing was what? It was this right here. That um, we say we know God. This is how he writes it. But yet we don't thank him and we don't praise him. I'm paraphrasing. Because what he's saying is there are people who say they know God, but they refuse to thank him. They refuse to praise him. They refuse to follow him. So let me ask this question as a follower. Because I told you I'm going to do the opposite. So me as a Christian, am I thanking God? Am I praising God? Now, a life that we live, that means this. Are others seeing my life being thankful to God? Are others seeing my life praising God? Now, this is the plug for the church. Ready? Because it should be done with the family right here. And then we should invite those, ready, that are on what you would call the list, which there is no such thing. You're either in sin or you're not in sin. And so what you do is you have those people who are your friends, your family. You don't turn your back on them. You allow them and you convince them and you plead with them and you do all that it is to invite them to sit next to you and they must see a life lived that thanks and praises. That is our question. Are we doing that? Because what it does is it leads to a turnaround for people in their faith to have a life of faith of their own. Let me say it this way. Without God, without thanks, without praise, without living a life of faith, that's when you get into what is said here in Romans chapter 1. Where you have these vain imaginations. Or you have these foolish thoughts. Or you have what you think is so intelligent and it's not. In fact, if you were to look up and really delve into it, those vain imaginations are absurd, stupid, without intelligent reasoning. That says a lot for our, our mind thought process. If we have no God, no thanks, no praise, 
no life lived out in faith, then our thoughts become as that. I, I'll take the middle one, stupid. Ridiculous. We cannot grasp God's worship or the nature of who he is. We can't take in any of it because we refuse, first of all, to have God. Then what that begins to do, it can do it to the Christian who, be, you know, they'll use that word backsliding. Still, may I say this? You can label anything you want to these, word, these, these things, but here's what it is. Either you live a life of faith following him or you sin. That's all it is. You cannot have both. You can't go, well, I'm going to live a life of faith on Sunday and Wednesday, but over here I'm going to... I'm going to call myself a Christian, but I'm going to do whatever I want, which is what is said right here in Romans chapter 1, that you begin to do whatever you want, whatever your heart's desires. And if it's not with God, it's against God. If it's not with God, it's an enemy of God. If it's not with God, then it is so far from God, and you begin to distance yourself from God. Rather than live that life of faith. In Romans chapter 1, in its writings, is as a result, their minds become dark and confused, claiming to be wise, but are just fools. And, and Paul writes it in such a way, just as a, like a reminder, who carves up an image and worships it? Before we start condemning people, what are we worshiping? I say it this way. Anything that becomes, comes into play of, of, of distancing you from God, that is what you are worshiping. Call it whatever you want. A phone, a TV, a car, a home, a job. A, 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 a friendship, and that's the worst. A friendship or relationship where you have decided they are not worth God. <laughs> that's when, that right there is when you start to um, worship other things. One of the hardest ones would be this. Verse 25. They traded the truth about God for a lie. And, and that's so huge. Because we live in a world where, the, well, first of all, we live in a world where everything is truth, which it is not. And then we, as, as followers, we're like, okay, so then what is truth and what is a lie? Take it this way. That should be joy to you. Because that should be something that drives you. What is the truth about God? And, and for us, what we have is Scripture. We have Scripture that leads us in truth about God. It is the best that we have. So delve into it. Let it be upon your heart. Because that's where you, do, where you will find out. It'll be real, it comes a lot easier. You know what? That is a lie. If you're going to say that God says do this, I know it's a lie. How do I know it's a lie? First of all, because it, it, it is unrighteous. Well, that's such a churchy word. Okay, here's what it is. You ever have something just knotted up your gut because you knew it was absolutely wrong? As a person, you knew it was wrong. You, call it, you can call it whatever you want. Conscience. I say it's the Holy Spirit at work within you. But whatever it is, it's knotting up your stomach and you make this conscious effort of either doing what is so knotting wrong or you go this way where, oh, wow, the knot just came free because I knew this was right and that was wrong. This was truth and this was lie. And so I, I always challenge, Pastor, the things that you said up on the pulpit this morning, it, 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 I'm not quite, well, let's just sit down and look at, let's look at it. Let's, because you know what, for a lot of times I'm paraphrasing because of time's sake, because we only have so much time to get through something, but what we can do is we can sit down and delve deeper, because you know what that does? It allows us to spiritually grow 
as long as we are growing with what God has and not what Brent has or what you have, what someone has that might be a lie. For so many people, they like to stick to one. All gays are going to hell. That's what they like to stick to. Remember what I said. If you really read what Paul's saying, Paul's saying this is, what, this is where we bring a turning point to people. Not condemning, a turning point to people. To where they turn to God. Okay? So, it, he wonderfully does this. He has that for a starter. And then he has that huge list. And I'm going to slow down with that for just one sec. Because it says, became full of every kind of wickedness. Okay? Then he, he really broadened it. Sin. Anything that's against God. Greed and envy. See, it, it, I know it says other things in order, but I'm not going to take it in order. There's greed, and over here is envy. They go hand in hand. Why? I want that right there. I want that so bad. I want that so bad. It must be mine. What can I do to make it mine? That's the greed of I want that. It's got to be mine. How about this? Because um, hate and murder is in the list. Okay? I love how Jesus did it. If you hate your brother. See... When you walk with God in life of faith, all of a sudden you start to see a whole lot more to what it means to live that life of faith that is truly righteous, which is life. That was up at the top there, right? Righteous life. And with that, now all of a sudden, I can change my thought process of what, I, what would be envy. You know what, God? Thank you for what I have. Why? Because you have provided everything I need. And you, you know what? And he still knows your wants and desires. See, God doesn't go, oh, here's what you do. You only stay on this need list. No, you, you can come to God. God, I, I would really like that. I want that. I desire that. And, and I'm not saying he's going to give you everything. What I'm saying is have conversation. That's how Jesus had brought us this life lived with him. Life lived the faith is this. I know God's going to provide everything I need. That's my faith. Not, um, and I know I'm not going to get everything I want. At least not till Karina gets big enough to get me the Lamborghini. I'll always make that one. But then there were some in here. Ready? That really stuck out. Quarreling. Malicious behavior. Gossip. <laughs> you know what? It, it, we're getting ready to close, Pastor Mark. Gossip, ready? You want to know how the world for a long time did it? You know who gossiped? Only the ladies. <laughs> See? You know why I hear, why I hear that? Because that's how it was. The only gossipers are ladies. Except for the guys. Ready? I'm going to do one. Tim the Tool Man Taylor. On, uh, no, I can't even think of the show. Home Improvement. Home Improvement. You know what? They would go into the hardware store, have a coffee and a donut, which that makes it not gossip. And they would talk about their wives, or they would talk about their relationships, or they would talk about other people as they stood around the coffee pot and donuts. So no, it's not just women who gossip. Gossip is gossip, which is why it is here. Anytime you come in to do something, and here's what gossip does, it usually hurts people. See, that's why it's here. And that's why people don't take it as, as, as any, oh, that's only a little thing, what we call it. Oh, why lie? Whatever you call it, it's still wrong. You know within yourself what is wrong. And that is why you're, so I say this in these closing moments, that even us who say we are followers of Jesus Christ, who try to live the life of faith, we have to be also on guard that we are not around the coffee pot and donut talking about other people, that we are not, that we are not, uh, 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 ready, backstabbers, insolent, <laughs> 
I'm telling you, when you, when you study, because uh, I'm not smart. I don't have a whole bunch of wisdom. And I looked at insulin, insulin, insulin. insulin. What in the world is insulin? You ever read something in scripture going, what is that? You know who helps me? Dictionary.com. Are you ready what insulin is? It is boldly rude, disrespectful, or even insulting. See, this is, as we close, as followers that say we're going to live a life of faith, we need to be on guard with our hearts at who we are. Because as we sit there and want to have the eyes of looking at others going, yep, you know what, as Pastor Brent was talking up here, boy, some names are popping in my head. That person's a gossip. That person's a backstabber. That person's even a hater of God. And, and, and that person's insulting. And that person's proud. Or that person's uh, 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 boastful. Or, ready? In the scripture? That person's always inventing new ways to sin. See, the people are like, you know, the world's getting worse and worse and worse. You know, it's not just getting, it's not that it's getting worse. What's happening is some of these old sins are becoming old sins. Nobody wants to do it. So someone comes along to invent some new cooler sins. Why do I say it that way? Because people, you don't fall, you don't fall into sin because it's bad. Like, whoo, man, see how, see how that's going to hurt me? That sin's going to hurt me. Man, it's going to even hurt my heart. Man, I won't ever do that one. No, sin becomes so cool. That's why it's a temptation first, and then I go into the sin of it. And people are inventing new sins. And then I like how he did one. He just throws it in there real quick. And disobey their parents. <laughs> disobey their parents. Break promises. Let me close with this. Pastor Mark, come on up. Be, our hearts need to be on guard. Be on guard because there are people that are watching us on how we live, on how we present what I may say the turnaround, the opportunity for everyone to be saved, for everyone to come to know God and to come to know Jesus as Savior, to come to know the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Here is one of the worst things, and that's why I started off probably with uh, problems of the churches. Not to name names, I really didn't mean that. But there's problems with churches doing it wrong. And the problem in Paul's writing time was it was the government was doing things wrong. The priests were doing things wrong. The churches, temples, were doing things wrong. And I don't mean wrong. They were promoting sin. Not only were they promoting sin, but they were encouraging others to do it too. And that's why I know when a church that comes on the news and they have an epic fail and, and, and uh, uh, mass suicides within the church or this killing of the church or going over here and killing with the church, the reason those take place is because those that are not living a life of faith that is righteous in the sight of God or right with God are the ones that are encouraging others to do the same. May we be a church today that is not that church, that is not that people. That when I walk up to people that I know, and it does not matter their walk of life, it doesn't matter because of where we live, whether they're illegal or legal, or whether they're black or white, or whether they're Hispanic or, or, or Asian, or whether they're um, uh, gay or not gay, or whether they're this or that. It does not matter because the purpose of the church is to introduce people to the Savior and the power of God that changes a life. You don't change it. God does. Why? Because he changed me. Let us stand. God, as we have heard words and have read text from the scripture, if there's someone here that does not know you, may this be the turning point. Knowing that you are loving them 
You might be angry at the things we do, but you still love us. And then loving them, maybe they may, may seek out forgiveness. Forgive me, God. That's the, that's the phrase. Forgive me for the knot in my stomach where I know I do wrong against you. Let's start there. And help me have the righteousness that is life. For those of us, God, that are always doing what we can through you to live a life of faith, help us in our missteps. Forgive us of our mistakes. May we be strong. And the total opposite of what is condemning. And may we be the, the, the light that is given the opportunity to share that turning point with others. In Jesus' holy name, amen.